One of the components of my Hi-Fi that I was really happy to find in good condition a couple of years ago was a Technics SH8058. This is a spectrum analyzer and graphic equalizer, a two-in-one. It not only looks pretty, but it's useful too. Well, it would be if it worked properly. The issue is, like with many of us now, this memory is not quite what it used to be. It completely forgets all its settings and presets every time the power is cycled. Looking at the manual, it seems like this memory relies on a battery. And given my recent experiences with old batteries that are hidden inside components, I think this is something that I should take a look at sooner rather than later. In fact, now seems like a good a time as any. The manual tells me that it uses a BR2032. Now, I found quite a few different varieties of surface mount configurations of this battery online, so I think it's time to open it up and see how the battery in mine is held inside. As usual, the manual tells you to take it to an authorised service centre, and the back tells you that there's no user serviceable parts inside. But the reality is, if I don't fix this, there's no one else that I can ask to do it for me. I do get a lot of emails from people asking me to recommend good electronics or hi-fi repair places, but the reason that I try and fix things myself isn't by choice. It's by necessity. I don't know of anyone else. I'm my own last resort, but fingers crossed, this one should be simple. Well, the battery was easy to find. It's mounted on the board and held in place with a pin on either side of it that runs down from the centre and those will be soldered in underneath. Now, one issue is that all the BR2032s I can find have a different pin configuration. They're designed to be laid horizontal rather than vertical, and they've got pins at either end to fit that design. But on top of that, taking out this whole board just to desolder a battery is not only a hassle, it's a bit risky. It seems like they'd have to unplug some of those old brittle ribbon cable connectors, and it seems far wiser and safer just to take things from above instead. I did a quick check to see if the battery could be peeled away from its pins, but no, that's definitely not going to happen. So instead, I'm just going to snip it out and solder a new one to the remainder of its legs. Now, it looks like this might already be a replacement battery, as once the mounting is pulled away from the side, it reveals it's a CR2032 from Toshiba, whereas the manual refers to the original being a BR2032 from Matsushita. Matsushita Group. The difference between a BR2032 and a CR2032 is the chemical makeup. The BR is going to have a slower self-discharge. In the owner's manual, it stated that the battery should last for 10 years, but BRs aren't anywhere near as common as the CRs, so I can see why someone would use a CR instead. I'm going to solder in this battery holder with a flip lid, so when it runs out again, swapping it out next time is going to be as easy as swapping the battery in a car remote key fob. But the first thing to find out before I put the lid back on is whether or not it's working. Will the graphic equaliser remember the position of the virtual sliders after a power cycle? Just to make sure this was a proper test, I left it unplugged for an hour and then came back, plugged it in again, and this time it came straight back on in the same state it was when it switched off. So it's just a matter of sticking that battery holder somewhere out of the way, yet accessible, and then putting the case back together. Now, while doing that, I did notice the lid was a bit bent, no doubt by something that had been placed on top of it at some point, but a quick bend over the knee the other direction, and it was back to being flush again. I also gave the whole thing a quick clean. It's now looking almost as good as new, which isn't bad going, because looking back at the old catalogues, it seems like this model, the SH8058 in silver, came out in October 1988. That's 35 years ago, and it only remained on the market for just a couple of years after that. Over the years, I've been asked quite a few times how a graphic equaliser is wired in with a hi-fi, and I've seen this question online quite a few times as well, so I thought I might as well cover it off here. So, on an amplifier or receiver of a certain age, you'll have a source selector to choose from the component you wanted to listen to. In this case, it lets you choose between a radio, record player, or an auxiliary input. But the selection you make there would also simultaneously be sent off to a tape output. Now, on this receiver, it's got two of them, so you can pick one of them, let's say tape two, and connect the record or out from there onto the line in on the back of the graphic equaliser. And then the output from the equaliser connects up to the play or input for tape two. Now, if you want to hear your audio routed via the graphic equaliser, you just press the tape two monitor. And then if you want to go back to the regular non-adjusted audio, you deactivate the tape two monitor. But because we've now used up one of our tape connections and say we need both of them because we wanted to connect up a reel-to-reel -reel and a compact cassette, 
to this amplifier, well, there's no issue because the tape in and out has been duplicated on the back of the equaliser and can be switched to using the input selectors on the front of it. Right, moving on, for demonstration purposes, I'm temporarily connecting mine up to some powered speakers as well as a mini disc player. And I'm going to be playing back this mini disc that was sent to me by a viewer. If you want to hear more, he's got a Bandcamp page, the details are on the screen. Now, the reasons that I was originally drawn to this particular graphic equaliser stroke spectrum analyzer unit is because it was the only one that I could find with a nice two-channel spectrum analyzer that was also available in the silver finish, which would match the rest of my hi-fi components. The sensitivity of that spectrum analyzer display could be changed between three different levels in order to better match the input that it's receiving, which does come in handy, as these can vary quite a bit when you've got a wide variety of components connected up. Now, as for the graphic equaliser side of things, the fact that this uses buttons rather than the traditional sliders was a big positive for me, as sliders over time can become oxidised, which leads to audio cutting out or crackling. Another good thing with this virtual slider system is that you can quickly switch the EQ settings out. You can swap between different ones at the push of a button. There are three fixed presets and three user memories, and you can use different EQ settings, for example, for different genres of music or perhaps time of the day, reduce the bass in the evening, or perhaps different hi-fi components. For example, one that reduces the treble and boosts the bass for your Teffy phone. And now, thanks to the battery backup, it remembers these settings. The audio is passed through even when the device is in standby, but it has to remain plugged into power, unplug it and the sound will stop. So really you might as well just leave it on and show in the spectrum analyzer. You don't have to keep the EQ option engaged and you can just enjoy the display. I'd really miss this now if it wasn't in my hi-fi. It looks interesting, but I also find it to be a useful tool as well. But one thing I've seen over the years, whenever I've mentioned graphic equalizers, you get the same old miserable audio files whining on about why you should never use a graphic equalizer in a hi-fi, how you should keep the sound exactly as it was mastered, completely failing to understand how individual room characteristics, the speakers you use in the players, even the media, all drastically affect the way that things sound in your house. As far as I'm concerned, both they and the horse they're riding on can go and do one. I'd say if it makes you happy, bring on the mega bass. My hi-fi has never been about getting the purest possible sound using the best available components. It's a music-based entertainment centre with the emphasis placed firmly on the enjoyment side of things. Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.